In this video, I'm going to show you numerous examples which demonstrate that ancient human civilizations were older and significantly more advanced than we were taught in school. And not only that, I will share multiple examples which overwhelmingly suggest that ancient human civilizations were globally connected across vast oceans and continents, which is simply not supposed to have been possible thousands of years ago. However, the debate of whether a lost ancient advanced civilization existed and was ultimately destroyed in a cataclysm remains at an all-time high. And not long ago, legendary author Graham Hancock engaged in a debate with archaeologist and university professor Dr. Flint Dibble on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast. And this epic four and a half hour long debate has reignited heated argument between archaeologists and alternative historians about just how old and advanced ancient civilizations actually were. In fact, let me just go ahead and dive right into this with a few specific examples that were discussed in that debate, which illustrate just how divided the two sides of the conversation are. The Yonaguni Monument of Japan is undoubtedly one of the most bizarre underwater stone features on Earth. The striking angles and straight lines take people by surprise the first time they see it. Just observe the highly unusual nature of this structure, which by the way, is located close to the shoreline yet reaches a depth of approximately 100 feet. And this remarkable structure consists of a series of step-like ledges that are so striking, it's hard to imagine that it could be a natural formation. In fact, look at the various nuanced details found throughout this incredible site, as the anomalies go beyond the series of step-like formations. In fact, notice the nature of what appears to be cut blocks that were seemingly, or at least appear to be, stacked on top of each other. And as you look at various other photos of this impressive site, also note the sheer size and magnitude of it when compared to people scuba diving around it. Now, also notice this square-like formation that appears to have been cut in half. Is this really the product of natural oceanic tidal erosion? Like I said, this site is truly one of a kind, and unlike anything we see anywhere else on the planet, which, suffice to say, appears to be anything but natural, leading many people to believe that it was cut and carved by the hand of man, which is why Graham Hancock and many others, including myself, suggest that it very well could be lost remnants of ancient human stonework, which by the way, you should know, this site was above water during the last ice age more than 12,000 years ago, when the Earth's sea levels were significantly lower, which would have made it fully possible for ancient humans to shape it into the formation we see today. Which brings me to something we should consider, which is its remarkably uncanny appearance that's similar to modern stone quarries we see throughout the world today. Take a moment to observe some varying side-by-side -side comparisons. Like I always say, look and think for yourself. However, this is where the stark difference in opinions comes in, as the skeptics, including Flint Dibble, state that there is no evidence that this structure is anything other than natural, that it is simply a fluke form of unusual natural erosion created by the, si or the tides of the ocean. But I find that argument intriguing because it begs the question, if this is indeed a product of natural erosion, then why don't we see examples anywhere else on Earth that is even remotely similar to this? I mean, just consider that there are over two and a half million kilometers of aggregate coastline that make up our seven continents and all the shorelines of all the islands existing around the world combined. That's more than one and a half million miles of shoreline. Yet, the site of Yonaguni only makes up a few hundred meters of shoreline. And by the way, look at it on both sides through this map depiction. The blasting of the ocean would have been hitting both sides and even on the side of it. So again, that doesn't make sense for being a natural feature of erosion. And again, if academics are to claim that this is simply a natural formation, then why can't they provide just one example from just one other place on Earth that is even remotely similar to Yonaguni? I mean, after all, we've all seen spectacular seashore cliffs from all over the world and various examples of natural erosional processes created by the tide and the wind. And nothing compares to the dramatic step-like formation we see at Yonaguni. In fact, there's really no comparison. Tidal forces simply do not form such striking step-like patterns, which I think we all understand because, again, we would have seen it elsewhere. So, not to mention that all the other nuanced formations around this site besides the step-like patterns 
which certainly catch the eye. Are we really going to say that all of these various examples were created through natural erosion? It seems to me that if nothing else, the site of Yonaguni warrants further study with an archaeological lens. And honestly, this one example may sum up the essence of that entire debate. But let me give you just one more thought-provoking example which will articulate or at least illustrate what I'm trying to say when I say the essence of the debate. The site of Ganang Padang in Indonesia was an early topic of discussion during their conversation, and this profound hilltop was geoengineered into a pyramidal-like structure of terraces and was designed using the natural volcanic rock that surrounds the area. It couldn't be more clear that the hand of man altered this site, which is certainly agreed upon by academics and the archaeological community. However, the debate involves the startling implication that it may be as much as 24 to 27 thousand years old, which would completely alter our understanding of human history, as this type of project would far exceed the alleged capabilities of prehistoric civilizations. So let me just cut to the chase. Graham Hancock visited this site multiple times, including for his hit Netflix show Ancient Apocalypse, where he showcased the use of ground-penetrating radar that identified a potential subterranean tunnel connecting to a chamber which has been dated to 27,000 years old. Could this be a man-made feature within the structure centered at the heart of this mysterious and incredibly old site, or just some natural anomaly? Well, on one hand, Flint Dibble argues that this alleged chamber is not provable evidence of ancient human activity, and on the other hand, you have Graham Hancock stressing that the possibility should be considered, and this site requires a full excavation to find out the answer, especially considering how enormous the implications are. I mean, just imagine what could be waiting to be discovered inside a 27,000-year-old pyramid chamber. So let's be clear. Is there a void consisting of a possible tunnel and chamber underneath the known ancient ruins at this site, which have been identified through scientific measurements, i.e. ground-penetrating radar? Yes. Has this potential subterranean tunnel and chamber been excavated or even explored? No, it has not. Okay, enough discussion, let's drill a hole, send a camera down, and find out exactly what it is. And encouraging further study and exploration is exactly what Graham Hancock has been advocating for. But to be honest, the response to the debate, now that it's over, has been quite interesting, as various academics and archaeologists have declared total victory that Graham Hancock failed to show definitive proof of a lost ancient advanced civilization. However, what I witnessed was that Flint Dibble didn't answer or otherwise dodged various consequential questions, and so much of Graham Hancock's work that he's shared over three decades wasn't even touched on during the debate. And the reality is that to have a effective debate, you need a good dance partner, and the nature of this conversation did not allow the most interesting details to come out. So that's exactly what I'm gonna share right now what I consider to be compelling examples which show that ancient human civilizations were older, more advanced, and globally connected, which is the complete opposite of what we were taught in school. Now, with that said, we were all, of course, taught that transoceanic sea travel wasn't possible until the year 1492 when Christopher Columbus sailed the Atlantic Ocean to the so-called New World. They still teach this erroneous fact today, but what I am going to show you now is arguably the most compelling example of a lost ancient globally connected civilization, but also happens to be by far the most controversial, something that virtually no one discusses and I have not shared in any of my prior videos. But let me quickly mention the sponsor of this video. We've all seen how crazy and uncertain the world has become, which is why all of us should be taking steps to be prepared. And I highly recommend the purchasing of an emergency medical kit from The Wellness Company, which allows you to preemptively obtain prescriptions for antibiotics such as z and amoxicillin, as well as other drugs such as hydroxychloroquine, Tamiflu, and even ivermectin, many of which are difficult to come by. And between the buzz going around of a bird flu or perhaps another pandemic of some kind, Preemptively purchasing the Contagion Kit from the Wellness Company would be a wise decision, especially considering that these entire kits cost you less than most visits to the doctor. Now, the kits are only available in the USA. However, everyone that can obtain one should have at least one of these kits in their household. If we find ourselves in an emergency situation, a toothache or even a minor infection could become fatal, which is why preemptively having antibiotics on hand could literally save the life of yourself or a loved one. Head to www.twc.health brightinsight and use promo code 
Bright Insight today to receive $30 off plus free shipping. The link is in the description of this video and the pinned comment down below. With all of that said, back to the video. So as I was just saying, what is arguably the most compelling example of a lost, ancient, globally connected civilization, and which just so happens to be the most controversial, is this symbol here. We all know its name, and we certainly all know the people who used it. However, many people are not aware that this is a prehistoric symbol that dates back nearly 10,000 years, and is inexplicably found on five continents around the world. Whether it be in the mountains of Armenia, estimated between seven to 10,000 years ago, to prehistoric Iran 7,000 years ago, to ancient Iraq 6,000 years ago, to ancient Egypt at least 3,000 years ago, even the ancient Greeks dating back over 2,500 years, to Ghana and West Africa, as well as Ethiopia, to even England several hundred years ago. In fact, it has even been found as far away as the remote island of Bali 1,000 years ago. And I recently learned that it's even been found in South America within ancient Peru. But perhaps the most mystifying example is that it has been found in the indigenous Native American tribes of North America as far back as 2200 years ago by the Hopewell Mound people in the modern state of Ohio. In fact, numerous other Native American tribes, including the Pima Indians, the Navajo, and the Yavapai Indians of the American Southwest, all use this symbol, and this is just a few examples. But it had even been used by tribes as far away as Alaska. How is it possible that this symbol was used in prehistoric times across five continents around the world, and in some of the most remote places imaginable? I do not think for a second that the use of this highly specific symbol is a coincidence. In fact, I think that it is evidence of an ancient and powerful civilization that once traveled the globe many thousands of years ago, and the symbol itself is a surviving relic of a once profound civilization that was passed down over many millennia, but was regrettably bastardized and reappropriated by evil people to the point that we can't even discuss it today. So, putting aside whatever motives and ideology were used for choosing this symbol more recently, the fact that it somehow exists across the world thousands of years before transoceanic sea travel was thought to be possible raises serious questions. This is a lost ancient mystery. And I should mention that what I shared were just a few examples, as this symbol has been found in India, China, and many different countries in Europe, literally all over the world. And again, putting modern evil motives and ideology aside, many are surprised to learn of the bizarre fact that they were obsessed with ancient archaeology. Believe it or not, the fictional Indiana Jones movies were based on some truths, and that these people searched for various ancient artifacts, including the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, and even Thor's hammer which makes you wonder why they would allocate so many resources to do so. I do not know what the answer is to that question, but it is rather fascinating, as this mystery has been seemingly hiding in plain sight. Again, few are aware of just how old and widespread this symbol is, and like I said, almost nobody discusses it. And this is a topic that I will continue to further research, but let me move forward with other interesting examples, such as the fact that pyramids are found on four continents around the world. From, of course, Egypt and Africa, to Cambodia and Asia, as well as even China. And, of course, the various pyramids of Mesoamerica we're all familiar with. But many are surprised to learn that even the ancient Greeks had a pyramid. No, I do not think that building pyramids is simply a natural progression of human ingenuity. Many will say that it's the most simple of structures to create, and that all you have to do is stack blocks on top of the others in ascending pattern, and voila, a simple pyramid is born. But to that, I totally disagree, as there is nothing instinctual or primitive about quarrying massive multi-ton stones, cutting and then lifting and stacking them hundreds of feet above the ground. And although many of the pyramids found around the globe were created thousands of years apart, I do think that they are evidence of a once global connection. Not necessarily a global civilization, but a connection that illustrates that humans had traversed the continents and communicated or traded knowledge or skill sets with each other at some point in the distant past. Which brings me to the profound mystery of ancient polygonal stonework, which I have of course discussed in detail in prior videos. As there are polygonal stones in Egypt found at numerous sites throughout the country, 
There are an abundance of polygonal stones found all the way over in Peru, which, by the way, were done with such unbelievable precision you'd almost think they were cut with lasers. And although I am not actually suggesting that, but they were clearly achieved with a method that far exceeds the alleged based copper tooling. I mean, this is an evidence of a technology that we don't know about in itself. And speaking of Egypt and Peru, let's not forget the similarity of these so-called nubs, which many refer to as lifting bosses. Whatever their purpose was, it seems to me that they are so similar in nature that it's not a coincidence, especially considering that they were found on four continents around the world respectively. And while I'm at it, let me remind you that polygonal stone walls have been found all over the world, throughout various countries in Europe, including Italy, you'll see them in a number of different locations, as well as in Greece, as well as in Turkey, which is of course considered Asia today, but again, I have shared these examples before, but when you compare side-by-side -side examples, it becomes obvious that this goes beyond mere coincidence. And by the way, many are surprised to learn that Japan has incredible polygonal stonework as well. I had the great pleasure of visiting this amazing country just a few months ago and was blown away at the magnitude of many of these relics and the polygonal shape that they are comprised of. Which reminds me, compare the similarities of these two stone sarcophagus between Egypt and Japan. I've shared this example across social media, and it is hotly debated, but if you want to know my opinion, I think that this is a profound example of an unknown cross-cultural connection between the continents. I mean, just look how similar they are. Now, one other example I want to briefly mention is what's referred to as the ancient equator theory, which correlates that many of the world's most significant ancient sites just so happen to align perfectly, including from Easter Island, all the way over to Machu Picchu in South America, to the Giza pyramids of Egypt, to Petra in Jordan, the Persopolis in Iran, Mohenjo-Daro in Pakistan, and all the way over to Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Others have suggested that these sites exist on what was once an ancient equator that has since shifted, and this is something that I will discuss in detail in an upcoming video involving ancient catastrophic pole shifts. Now, what I've shared so far are just a few examples that illustrate the potential that ancient human civilizations were globally connected across vast oceans and continents. But the reality is that ancients were undoubtedly far more advanced than we were led to believe. And I would argue that the movement of massive megalithic stones is a key piece of evidence. Last September, I was able to check something off my bucket list, which was to travel to the mysterious site of Baalbek in Lebanon and what I witnessed blew my mind. And I have to say that I think that this is arguably the best example of a lost ancient advanced civilization. There is so much to say and share, so this will be the sole topic of my very next video, as it's so profound that it requires an entire video in itself. But to give you something to think about, notice that you will also find examples of this symbol all over this enigmatic site. I find that interesting. But moreover, the ruins of Baalbek goes far beyond the known capabilities of the ancients. For example, the so-called Trilophon stones are comprised of three individual 900-ton stones that were transported before being lifted and perfectly stacked approximately 23 feet off the ground. How this was done is a mystery, as nothing was left behind to describe who did this, how, or even when. No, I do not believe the Romans are responsible for this has been, as has been erroneously claimed, and I will lay out a compelling presentation in my next video and you can formulate your own opinion. But for the point of this video and in the context of working with super massive stones, I will say that the 1,000 metric ton Ramesseum statue of Luxor, Egypt is definitive proof of a lost technological capability. This statue was carved from one single piece of granite stone and of, of course is now destroyed, which is a bizarre mystery in of, of itself. But while it was intact, it weighed a staggering 2.2 million pounds and was inexplicably transported some 170 miles. Let's be clear, there is nothing that the known dynastic Egyptians did that even remotely compares to this. The only example we have of them moving a statue is this example here, which was briefly mentioned during the Flint Dibble Graham Hancock debate. And, but what's worth mentioning is that this statue is a mere 58 metric tons and was only moved nine miles or 15 kilometers. And to do so, they dragged it on a wooden sledge with approximately 172 men. But mind you, this statue is 17 times lighter 
than the 1,000 ton Ramesseum statue. Are we really going to pretend that primitive wooden sleds are infinitely scalable? Because show me a primitive wooden sled that could support 2.2 million pounds and over hundreds of miles. Good luck. How many ropes would you need? How long would they be? And how many people would you need to do it? And again, what wood would not splinter and shatter with that type of weight? And keep in mind that this one statue is equivalent to the weight of nearly 16 Abram tanks. It literally ranks among the heaviest objects transported in all of human history. In fact, this may sound like a funny comparison, but 1,000 metric tons is equivalent to over 22,000 individual 100 pound dumbbells that you see at the gym and you probably can't even lift one of them. But I happened to snap this photo while working out at my own gym, which inspired this comparison. Again, this one statue equates to over 22,000 individual 100 pound dumbbells and that was moved over hundreds of miles. To further the comparisons though, we must compare what our modern capabilities are today to fully appreciate what an enormous undertaking this was. So let me take a moment to acknowledge some of the world's largest and most powerful heavy equipment our modern civilization has developed. What you're seeing here is the world's largest ultra-class haul truck ever created. The Belaz 75710 is a sheer marvel of engineering. So large that you must travel up two flights of stairs to reach the cockpit. In fact, the tires themselves are 13 and a quarter feet in diameter, which is virtually equivalent to the height of a large African bull elephant. And this truck has eight of these tires. And this is where things get wild, as despite having the highest payload capacity on Earth at 496 tons, that is still only half the weight of the 1,000 metric ton Ramesseum statue. In other words, you would need two of these trucks to move it. And while I'm at it, let me give you one more fun example. The Komatsu PC-8000 is one of the world's most powerful heavy excavators. Just compare the size of its bucket to people. Enormous. Yet. Its bucket has a max lifting capacity of just 100 tons, which is only one-tenth the weight of the Ramesseum statue. And although you certainly would not use an excavator to lift and transport a large object, it's simply not what it was designed for, but I use this comparison to illustrate just how insanely heavy a 1,000 metric tons uh, statue actually is, when you, especially when you compare it to some of the largest hydraulic equipment our modern civilization has today. So. How would we move something of this weight? Well, as I've shared before, we must consider the example of the 340 ton stone that was transported to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in 2012, which was cited as the largest project of its kind since the Egyptians built the pyramids. And to move this one stone over 106 miles, they had to custom build a 260 foot long, 32 foot wide, 196 wheeled trailer truck around the stone itself and it traveled at four miles an hour it took 11 nights and costed a whopping 10 million dollars and took an entire year of planning and this one stone is just one third the weight of that 1000 ton ramesseum statue in other words how the egyptians managed to do this with primitive methods is totally inexplicable the mystery is real and the ancients were undoubtedly more advanced than we were led to believe and it's there for all who have eyes to see. And speaking of incredible feats accomplished by the ancients, here is another highly thought-provoking example. Let's go all the way over to Machu Picchu in the Peruvian Andes of South America and consider that this one 50 metric ton stone, which according to university archaeology departments, was theorized to have been pushed by hundreds of men up the steep hill to Machu Picchu, and by the way, allegedly without the use of the wheel as they were not known to have it at that time. But look at just how insanely steep that incline is and consider that this one stone weighs a whopping 110,000 pounds. I don't care how many people you want to pretend push that stone up this mountain, but this guesswork, which is exactly what it is, a total guess, doesn't seem feasible at all. And like I said, the mystery is real. Whoever brought this stone up to the top of Machu Picchu clearly had a method or capability of doing so that we are not aware of. And speaking of capabilities that are unknown to us, the very precision of various ancient stone cuts around the world only make the mystery of that much more impressive. Whether it's the 
50-ton granite stones that were brought 500 miles to the Valley Temple located in front of the Sphinx, which were cut with such precision that you can't even fit a razor or a human hair in between. Even the stones that make up the floor around the Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau were pieced together with such precision that you can hardly see the line cut itself. Notice these examples I took photographs of while I toured Egypt. Still watertight precision thousands of years later. And the mystery of the ancients can also be found in the most random and little known places. For example, the Al Nasla stone located in the remote desert of Saudi Arabia is a total enigma. Measuring 30 feet wide and 20 feet tall, it is arguably too large and precise to have been cut by some alleged enormous ancient primitive th uh, saw blade. But of course, archaeologists say that it wasn't cut at all, that it must surely be some sort of fluke natural erosion, but I'm sorry, I just don't buy that. This is clearly a cut, and if you want to argue that this is natural, then find me just one other example from anywhere else on Earth that is even remotely comparable to this. Again, like I always say, look and think for yourself. There are many other examples that I could include in this video which illustrate the mysteries of our ancient past that contradict what we were taught, that we are globally connected, or that we are far more advanced than we were led to believe, whether it's the mention of precision statues or vases. But to say that there is no evidence of a lost ancient advanced civilization is simply not true. The mystery is real and there are accomplishments that were done that far exceed what we were taught and it's there for all who have eyes to see. Now, what I rather focus on now is going to work on my video on Baalbek, which like I said, I consider it to be the smoking gun evidence of a legitimate lost ancient advanced civilization. So stay tuned for that. But with that said, tomorrow I'm going to be hosting a live stream where I'm going to discuss not only this video, but the debate between Flint Dibble and Graham Hancock, because there are many other details about that debate that I did not include in this video. In fact, information has come to light that seriously questions a lot of the evidence that Flint Dibble shared in order to try to win the debate. And I decided not to include them in this video because I want to keep this video, I don't want it to be negative, but some of these things do will make you question the ethics involved and what people do to try to win a debate. So I have a very special guest coming on to join me on the live stream. I think you're going to find it very interesting, and there's going to be a number of details, like I just said, that I know you will find to be, well, of interest. But with that said, leave a comment and share what your thoughts are on everything I shared in this video, as well as share any examples you have that you think is compelling evidence that the ancients were globally connected or were more advanced than what we were taught in school. Um, also, you can support me by following me on rumble.com. I'm growing my presence there and also support me on Locals. This weekend, I will be doing a live Q&A on the Locals platform. And it's such a small, inclusive environment that those who support me will have every question or comment that they write out to me addressed. So it's a way of, you know, when I do these live streams and there's thousands of people there, not everything you say will ever be seen, unfortunately. But follow me on Locals to be able to have that not be an issue. But that said, my name is Jimmy Corsetti. My channel is called Bright Insight. Hit the like button, subscribe, and stay tuned for my next video on Baalbek. Take care, everybody.